Think about the last time you were on a roller coaster. The speed, the excitement, how fast the ride is. Think about the big drop, the biggest one, right? That swooping feeling that you get in your stomach. If you ask people how long the drop was on a roller coaster, humans will consistently overestimate the amount of time they were falling. Stanford psychologist David Eagleman did an experiment where he actually tested this because it's important. This series is about time. And if we're experiencing time at different rates, did time actually slow down? Are we actually seeing more time when time slows down during some situations? The experiment involved people being dropped backwards 45 meters in the air off of a platform into a net. <laughs> the people reached speeds of over 110 kilometers per hour. That's like 70 miles an hour. And they asked people to guess the length of the drop. They overestimated by more than a third. The actual drop was three seconds, so they maybe said four seconds, four and a half, five. That's a huge discrepancy. On top of that, they asked them to read something as they fell. If the brain was actually experiencing time at an increased rate, they would have been able to read more stuff on the screen. However, they couldn't because the time is perceived as slower. It's not actually slower. Humans' perception of time is not consistent. People think that car crashes last forever. Time slows down, and we see it in films all the time. They've gotten really good at showing us what this feeling looks like. But neuroscientists think that this is a result of the amygdala. The amygdala is the emotional center of your brain. It's this really old part of the brain, way deep in there, and it releases emotions and has connections to memory. It's a really important part of your brain, and it can ratchet up or down the brain as a whole. Think of it like like the brain's transmission or gearbox. It's got the fear center and the emotional center in there. So when we need to change gears, brrr, the amygdala can do that. And it's part of why we feel like time is elongating during stressful situations. Like, for example, personally, when I got engaged, <laughs> I don't remember anything. I was so nervous. It felt like the moment was so long. And like, it felt like it took 10 minutes. And then I made a video about it, and the whole video is like 90 seconds long. <laughs> I know, it's so crazy. Time is about what's up here, not what's out here in a lot of ways. Welcome to Uno Dose of Trace. This is episode two of five on time. Every month I pick a topic and I dig into it, breaking it into chunks so we all understand it a bit better, myself included. And this month, talking about time. Today, the psychology and human experience of time. And your brain is gonna melt, or at least you're gonna think about it differently. And that's my hope anyway. So let's kick into it. Hi, hi, hi there, TikTokers. This is, you know, just a pun about time. I don't know. Let's talk about this metronome experiment that happened. A metronome is what people use when they're measuring music. You see it in films a lot if you're not a musician. It's just a little box that tick, 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 tick. If a metronome ticks at a fast rate, the human brain doesn't perceive it as individual ticks but instead as a single stream, like a single sound. At a slow rate, the human brain perceives the ticks as individual moments in time, each a discrete, isolated, perceptual event. Each tick is what they would call this in neuroscience in a separate temporal field. Words by themselves don't work. Words by themselves don't work, but it's because our brain interprets them as individual moments in time. And you might wonder what this has to do with time, but perception is important. Words that are happening now are important to you. And words that happened then are somewhat less important sometimes, and words that are going to happen are somewhat more. Of course, that depends on culture and person and where you are in your life and what's happening. And it's all part of the same temporal field, the psychological present. Think about all of the different ways that this will affect time, not just metronomes, music, and speech, not just falling in car crashes and getting engaged, but like clock chimes. If it's four o'clock, easy. You can totally count. You know it's four o'clock. You don't have to go, oh, it's, oh, how many times has it been chiming? Whereas if it's noon,
y you gotta count. But if you pick up in the middle, sometimes you get lost, you get distracted. They're not part of the same temporal field. Experiencing the flow of time is inherent to being human. We're born, we watch ourselves change as we age, we grow old, we die, we overlap with thousands of other humans who are all doing that same thing. And each of us floating down this river of time are doing so at different rates and they're doing so at different meeting places. A poet once sang, time the past has come and gone, the future's far away, and now only lasts for one second one second. But is that true? Is time really segmented into seconds and that's the most important thing? No, not at all. In fact, one MIT study found that human brains can perceive images that are visible for only 13 milliseconds. That's 0.013 seconds. And if you ask someone to, you know, come back in an hour, even without a clock, even without a wristwatch, most people know approximately what an hour is. Our brain is good at measuring time. And yet, time is also learned. Because if you ask a three-year-old, what are you going to do tomorrow? Only one in three will give an answer that makes any sense. When you give a salty food to a three-year-old and you ask what they want, a pretzel or water, they're going to pick water because they just ate a salty food, obviously. But if you ask what they want tomorrow, they're still going to pick water because they can't imagine tomorrow. They can't imagine being hungry then and wanting a pretzel. Time is a learned behavior. Sometimes time feels different to a human. Sometimes it feels fast, sometimes it feels slow. We know this from the falling and music experiments that I already mentioned, but the rates of this slowdown vary based on scalar expectancy theory. Imagine that you have an internal clock, a pacemaker. You could also think of it as a metronome. And every tick gets stored for a little bit and they accumulate faster ticks make things feel longer because there's more accumulation. Slower ticks make things feel shorter because there's less accumulation. So time flies when having fun, faster ticks. There's you know lots of things accumulating and those could be memories, those could be your experiences of time. This is all very abstract. The school bell could be taking forever. Maybe that's slower ticks. You're not making as many memories, so things are just kind of zooming through your head. And yet, when you see food picks and you're hungry, if you show those to participants in studies, and they rate how long the pick was on the screen. If they're hungry, they seem to last for longer because your brain is soaking in all that chocolatey goodness. <laughs> that is scalar expectancy theory. There's no single clock inside of the brain that does everything. And instead, it's actually a bunch of different clocks. Using brain scans, they found that the brain tracks time in a bunch of different ways. We're built to do it. Firstly, there's the circadian rhythm, which is very common in sleep studies and in most kind of pop sci kind of circles. Most people know the circadian rhythm, day night cycle. There's also the timing of body movements, you know, to make sure that you don't like hit yourself when you're trying to do stuff. And that is proprioception. It's, there's also tracking time as it passes. Like how long has it been? Has it been an hour? Has it been 10 minutes? For the latter, a 2013 study found two clocks inside of the brain, one in the striatum, which is our primary neural clock, and the scans there show that there's activity when you ask people to pay attention to time passing. There's also the hippocampus, which is responsible for our memories, and that might track time too. The hippocampus would be better than at tracking long time periods, the hypothesis goes, whereas the striatum might be shorter time periods. For example, how long have you been eating breakfast, or how long have you been in the shower? That would be the hippocampus. That's a long duration. How long does it take me to cut a peach? Oh man, it takes forever. You just like have to cut around to the like middle and you have to like slice everything and it's so messy and I love it, but it's like, oh, it takes so long. <sighs> the striatum, that would be the other internal timekeeping and it competes with the hippocampus. And it's more like, was that two minutes or three minutes? Was that two hours or 30 minutes? It's about comparing how much time things happen, not about tracking the amount of time that you're doing something. Does that make sense? On top of that, the striatum and hippocampus seem to be competing with each other to determine time. So we have these two clocks and they're kind of fighting in our brain to tell us how much time has gone by. And we know this because we look at a lot of brains, mainly broken ones as well. Experiments with mice with damaged striatum found that they're actually performing better at telling time 
which is weird. So the hippocampus might be a more accurate clock because again, remember one clock is competing with the other. But if you have a damaged hippocampus, which happens during Parkinson's, people had problems with overall timekeeping for longer periods. And we see this in patients who have schizophrenia and in Parkinson's, they have problems with the flow of time and it could come back to damage to their hippocampus. But fam, more research is needed in this. I mean, don't you want to know where time exists? Of course you do. And there are other brain areas involved with this as well, and we don't have enough research on it. The basal ganglia, the cerebellum. The basal ganglia is probably mostly related to rhythm. The cerebellum is more intervals, like a stopwatch. And this goes both ways, because you can also think about flow states. You ever been in a flow state where you're working and all of a sudden time seems to zoom by? The flow is when you're in the groove on something and everything else just falls away. You just focus and time seems to fly. And for example, you can replicate that in a 2004 study. Are all these circles on screen for the same amount of time? Every one of those images on the screen was there for the same duration, but it's possible that time dilation occurred for you. The oddball image might have felt like it was on the screen for a longer or shorter time but it wasn't. That is a perception trick. Perception also changes as you age. See, you remember when you were a kid and young summers, they just lasted forever, right? Summer is still only a couple months and yet, wow, it felt like an eternity. And researchers think that novel memories might make time feel longer, whereas fewer novel memories makes time feel shorter. Think of the metronome ticking again. New memories, wow, there's a lot going on. I'm accumulating all of this new data and I have to put it all together in a timeline and it feels like so much longer. But if you do the same things every day and you don't meet a lot of new people and you don't have a lot of new conversations, time is gonna feel shorter because there's just less timeline to have. But of course, then we get to time flies when you're having fun again. How does that work if you're making fewer memories? Does your brain work faster because it's making memories while you're having fun? And what about waiting for the school bell? If you're watching the clock tick, aren't you making new memories? Surely you are, but you know, you're paying attention to the, it's confusing. Again, more research is needed. Chances are, based on at least my analytics, my audience is predominantly in the US. So I would like to point out a cultural perception of time as well. Do you ever hear of island time or Irish time? Germans are always on time, etc., etc. Those are cultural frames for time. One of the first things that you do when you come to a new culture and want to sell your product or tell them a message is learn how they value time. Americans are taught, this is not universal, that time is money. Time can be wasted. Time must be used fruitfully. We can't just sit around, that wastes time. We can't do something that's not societally valuable, like maybe watching YouTube videos. That would be wasting time. This comes from a cultural frame of a future-oriented culture. The USA has a future-oriented time frame, as do countries like Austria and Germany. But present-oriented time frames exist as well. Places like France and Spain, where they value the now. What you're doing today is more important than where you will be in a week, where you were yesterday. It makes sense. You have things like closing on Sundays and siestas and making sure that people have time to enjoy the now. There's also past oriented frames like in Britain, Japan and in China and some Latin American countries, places where what happened yesterday is valuable, even more so than what's going to happen tomorrow, because there's this tradition to uphold and there's important learnings to come from the past. So let me give you an example, because I learned this over a whole semester and you're learning it in like just a couple minutes. So you have these past, future and present frames and they all have different values and they are all equally important and valuable to that culture. Yes, you might think that having a future frame is important if you're in the US, but that's because that's what you were taught. Meanwhile, another country's got an equally valuable stake in their past oriented culture. So let's say you wanted to sell a mobile phone to a past oriented person. Maybe you could try and sell them on the ability 
ability to video chat with their grandparents or enjoy pictures that they took on a holiday years ago. Maybe in a present oriented frame, I would want to show people that you can easily silence notifications or find a restaurant where you can spend time with people who you care about today. And in a future oriented society, everything the US does is uh, how you would sell a mobile phone. The newest tech, the newest apps, the fastest screens, helping make you use your time more efficiently and not waste it. It also might help you understand how time is created by us. And it varies from place to place. If someone is a late person, that doesn't make them bad. Maybe they just have a different time frame than you. <laughs> when I tell you all this, does it kind of help you see the code in the matrix? Speaking of code, I have an offer code for you. I know normally you'd have like a clever segue from the content to this message, but hey, you're smart. That's why I'm just gonna lay this out here. A while back, I really wanted to start making these series, but I wasn't sure if they would work. I was worried that the YouTube algorithm might tank my idea or that I'd lose subscribers. I just wouldn't be able to make it work for myself while also still maintaining the integrity of my channel. So I was really happy to have Nebula. I started Nebula with some other creators to have a place where thoughtful creators like myself and tons of others can just make stuff and try things and experiment and enjoy doing what we do best, which is creating. Nebula has a lot of the educationalist creators that you love from YouTube, but pretty much without the ads. And also by joining you support us directly. Not to mention, we get to mess around and try things that we'd never be able to do on the YouTubes without worrying about algorithms and click-through rates and all of that. Plus, we get curiosity stream as well, or other way around. I've mentioned it a lot on this channel, mainly because Curiosity Stream loves Nebula. They love it so much that when they said, hey, we want to bundle Curiosity Stream and Nebula, we were like, what's the best deal out there? Give us one better. And they did. So for a limited time, our friends at Curiosity Stream are giving you 26% off all their annual plans. We fact checked it, best deal anywhere. For about a dollar a month, you can get both Curiosity Stream and Nebula, and you're supporting creators you love directly, and you can listen to voices like David Attenborough or Chris Hadfield talk about the world and the universe, or you can listen to us on Nebula talk about the history of World War II, the history of synths, also working titles, and my show, and all of these other amazing creators as well. You can even watch our token Gen Zer Alex learn about Limp Biscuit for the first time. Seriously, that's a show that we have. To get all of these, you can use the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash trace. It's that easy. Use the promo code trace. You're going to get the 26% off of the gear. You're going to get both services and you can feel great about it because clicking that link directly helps me keep this channel going. On top of all of that, you get this episode and all of the other episodes in this series already. That's right. You can watch the whole thing over on Nebula right now. CuriosityStream.com slash trace. Use the promo code trace. Only $15 for a whole year. Thanks for considering it, but let's go back to the science of time. So time, remember, this is all affected by your amygdala, like a gear shifter. You know, like we're gonna go fast. We're gonna go slow. Dad, I wanna go fast. Car crashes, wedding proposals, roller coasters, fears of flying, timed test, time distortion happens all the time. Pun intended. Funny thing about that though, it actually seems to slow down, but it doesn't actually slow down. We only remember it as being slow. Like a slow computer struggling to open Chrome five years in. The computer is the same speed, it's just the world that's changed. It's got a lot of stimuli to process. And again, this is shown from that David Eagleman study from earlier. People felt time slow down as they fell. But another thing that dilates time, awe, like true awe inspiration. If you sit and experience nature or experience something truly awe-inspiring, like a giant snow-capped mountain or space, <laughs> a study found that people estimated the duration of time that they spent there as slower than in nature. This even worked when they put on VR headsets, although not as well. Because time is about perception and about the viewer, time isn't a single flow that is always the same. It is relative. There is an anecdote from the New York Times, March 1929, page three, column three. Quote, when you sit with a nice girl for two hours, you think it's only a minute. But when you sit on a hot stove for a minute, you think it's two hours. And that's relativity. Thanks, Uncle Albie. Albert Einstein. More on that and him next time.
Thanks so much for tuning in. Please come back and check out episode number three. We're gonna talk about whether time is real on Friday. I'm so excited for this one. And of course, we've still got two more episodes after that, including an episode with Dr. Katie Mack on next Wednesday. So please stick around, subscribe, check out all of the episodes here on Uno Dose of Trace. I am Trace. I thank you so, so much for watching. Whew, I gotta go get some water. I'll see you in the future.